Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. John here from Wild Boar Cycling. Uh, I've got a real treat for you today. Um, we were at a um, Santa Rosa Cycling Club monthly meeting um, last week, and we had the honor of having one of our local professional cyclists, Allison Tetrick, come and speak to the group. Uh, she's a cowgirl, she's a storyteller, she's an incredible athlete, and wow, the story that she shares with us about her courage and her resiliency is really worth watching and it's a uh, motivational for everybody so sit back and enjoy so <laughs> i know nope this is like i got done riding like two hours ago and i was like mm, i feel like getting dressed up um so thank you so much for having me um i live in petaluma I've been in Petaluma for over 10 years. Um, my good friend Kathy's here with me and my husband Blaze for my support. And um, so I'm sure I see a lot of you out there on the road um, riding. I love to ride my bike. Um, I ride it more than most people. Um, it's also my job. <laughs> but uh, so I've been a professional cyclist uh, for the last whew, 15 years, um, looking at him from the numbers. I've raced on the world tour, like the, from the Tour de France, raced and represented Team USA, world championship medalist, three-time gravel world champion. Um, and, uh, but the ultimate thing is during this time, I've just like loved riding. And so when I sent um, <laughs> to John and Steve the title of my talk, I didn't know I ha was needed a title. Um, <laughs> so they created this, I think, was it, did you? Yes. It was called Forged in Cycling. And uh, because I said, oh, I have so much to talk about. But really, guys, also, I love to talk. So you can shut me up. And he's going to have a lot of warning signs over there because I'll keep you here. <laughs> um, but also, this is super low key. Uh, I didn't write a script or anything. I just love connecting with my community. Sonoma County is so important to me spending thousands and thousands and thousands of hours on these roads and hopefully thousands and thousands of QOMs. But like, I spent a lot of time out here and so for me to talk to you is what makes my life have purpose. So I appreciate your time. But when I sent all this stuff, <laughs> I don't know, I sent like a trail of words and he came up with the topic was forged in cycling. I've been through a lot. Um, I've raced my bike a lot, and I've crashed a lot. As you can see, I'm a professional. Um, <laughs> so I just wrote that cycling is a forge, a place where character is built and refined through challenges and victories. And cycling found me. I never found cycling because cycling is in my blood. And throughout my whole career of racing, we could talk about winning and losing, but let's be honest, it's bike racing. So you lose 99% of the races even <laughs> that you ever compete in. So I have won very, very small amounts compared to what <laughs> I have lost, but through that I have learned uh, so much. Um, I grew up here in California, so born and raised in California. My parents have a cattle ranch, so cowgirl is accurate. Um, I dressed like I was going to a board meeting because that was really fun for me, but I'm a cowgirl at heart, and my parents have a big working beef cattle ranch up in Redding, so Shasta County now, and I grew up down in Los Alamos. And I didn't start riding bikes, so that's something that when I look at you guys, I think so many people think, like, you want to do your first century. I just did a whole thing at Bicycle Magazine about, like, how to do your first century. Check it out. But, <laughs> century, whoever, century. Yes, got it. But it's... <laughs> I, I mean, it's just never too late to start something. Um, so I grew up on a ranch. I didn't play organized sports or anything. We, we were really far from town. Um, you know, no trash pickup, anything like that. But what happened is I had very athletic parents that instilled a lot of confidence and free spirit in me that I just got on the horse and rode and I worked on the ranch and all of these things. And I, I grew up really strong and empowered. And then I had to go to school. <laughs> and it turns out there is, you know, genders and stereotypes and these ceilings that are, should be crushed. Um, and, and so that was interesting, but I, I went ahead and I played tennis in college. I'm an NCAA All-American tennis player in college. And I didn't start playing until I was in high school. So I didn't, I didn't race a bike at all until after graduating from college when I was a biochemist working in uh, chemistry research and drug discovery. And so there's just something that's I want you guys to think about before you leave that's like regardless of what your goal is, 
what you dream of. First of all, find a goal that inspires you, not your buddy or your partner or the internet. Find something that truly makes you want to get on your bicycle or work harder. Find that goal, but it's never too late to start. And we're going to get there because people go, so you are on the cattle ranch, you play tennis, then you're a biochemist in Boston where I'm headed tomorrow. And then I became a professional cyclist. How did that happen? And it happened because of this very important man in my life. I'm like show and tell, guys. No PowerPoint. Here we got it. My grandfather, <laughs> uh, Grampy, Paul Tetrick, uh, he got me into bikes. I wish I could prop that up, but I'm going to probably crash it. Yep. OK. Um, so my grandfather raced until he was 85 years old. <laughs> He's a 17-time uh, national master's champion, time trial road race criterium. Uh, but Grampy, we're going to call him Grampy. His name is Paul. Uh, Grampy didn't start riding a bike until he could retire. He never went to college. He got drafted for the Korean conflict, um, which he would say that. I say war. He says conflict. He's very, you know, he has since passed away. He's very important to me. Um, but he, he worked as a contractor in LA, and he worked and worked and worked. And when he could retire, he ran a lot. And then running hurts, as we all know. So does cycling. And he got into bike racing at when he was 60 years old. And he kept getting faster, and he kept trying. And my grandfather was a tough bird. Um, he's as grisly as you want to think. It's like John Wayne meets Clint Eastwood. It was a, it was a thing. Like, talking about his emotions wasn't something he said to me, right? Like, I worked so hard just to get him to tell me he loved me. I knew he loved me, but those words with his childhood, getting married at 18, going to war at 18, and all these things he went through and just working so hard. Love was not something he could communicate verbally, but through the bike and through his actions, I knew he loved me. And so cycling became our love language in a way. Um, I'm really going to try to get through this without crying. Um, and so we always used to pick up my hands. I actually have very big hands, for the record. Uh, there's a Seinfeld episode about that, but he'd pick up my hands and he'd be like, ow, look at these hands. And I'm like, yeah. Um, you, you, could, you could go to the Olympics. You could do anything you want. And I um, was playing tennis, and he was bringing me back musette bags from Mammoth Mountain Century or whatever, right? And I'm like, that's dorky. And he like, why did you give me a purse? Why do you have a purse? So confused. And he's like, you need to ride a bike. And he's, I'm like, that's very bright clothing. It's really dorky. I'm not going to ride a bike. I play tennis. Turns out I, I start cycling. And um, eventually, I, I start and I surprise him. I buy a bike off of eBay. I drive from Texas, where I was in college, to Colorado. And I drive there, and I surprise him at his local time trial uh, there in Denver. And I'm like, Paul Tetrick? And I got a bike. It's too small for me. It's not a good purchase, but it got me on there. And, and the next thing I know, it, I start racing. Um, and he, I get invited to the Olympic Training Center there in Colorado Springs, uh, so a talent ID camp where they test all these things. And to see my grandfather come there and visit me with tears in his eyes, this man that doesn't show emotion, and just like, I knew you had it in you, Al. And I wasn't trying to prove anything to him, but for his belief that whole time. So something else I want you guys to think about, you never know whether it's your kids, your partner, your friends, your grandkids, it's like you're inspiring somebody and you will really make a difference in somebody's life. So Grampy was big in my life because, um, so the guy that has no emotion, I have a lot. Like I cry every day probably. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. I got a lot of emotion and I wear my heart on my sleeve and I would call him and cry. And instead of being scared that he would get like a little ruffled and uncomfortable, he would just be like, take it in and be like, yep, all right, you know? So I wanted to, teach you or tell you a few things that he taught me and um, so first of all yes I he's the first person I always called when I finished a race one lost crashed um, he was safer than my parents because grandparents usually have a little less judgment and also he just got me he got me in this like way that was really important and so my first race I actually had to borrow his jersey that was pretty funny I <laughs> wore anyway uh, so the wisdom I learned from him, so you guys think about this when you ride. This is the weirdest advice, but wiggle your toes. 
just think about it every, you know, 15 minutes, 10 minutes, wiggle your toes. And he told me that, he's like, did you wiggle your toes? And I'm like, I don't know. I was going so hard, I forgot, like I forgot like my name. And he's like, just wiggle your toes. And when you wiggle your toes, you feel that like the stress actually is coming out because if you're wiggling your toes, lessens your calf cramps or other things and you're not tensing up on the bike. Cause so many times on the bike, we like white knuckle, like if you're going too hard or you're nervous in a pack or something like that. So I also do piano fingers, but make sure your hands are always on the bars. But wiggling your toes is a weird thing and it sends up energy through your body regardless of your effort. So Grampy's first tip that I will never forget. Uh, also just do your best. I would call him being crying because I lost and heaven forbid, you know, I didn't win this race I was supposed to. And, he, and I'm crying and he goes, well, did you do your best? I was like, yes. He's like, well. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> I mean, if you can go back and fix something, learn from it. But if you did your best, what else can you change? Uh, he also said cycling teaches you a lot of humility. He said there's always somebody better than you. And I'm like, I'm world champion. He's like, tomorrow you wake up, you can get beat. <laughs> I was like, Accurate. Awesome right now. And so cycling teaches you humility. So there's always somebody better. And that doesn't matter because you're ultimately being the best that you personally can be, and you're that only, you're that, you're that beacon there. And then he also told me to rest, which is not easy for me. I do not rest well. Um, you can see I have a high amount of energy, <laughs> and it takes a lot for me to get tired, but he told me that rest days were more important than my training days. And he would call me and say, like, Al, how are you doing? Oh, this hurts, this hurts, my legs are sore, my gosh, that race was so hard. And he was like, well, yeah, you're a professional athlete. You're going to hurt the rest of your life. But perhaps just remember, Al, like rest one week a month. So his rule was one week a month was a rest. I haven't quite gotten to that one yet, but I'll let you know. And then this last tip was just more. And so besides the wiggle to the toes, the other thing, Grampy and I love to time trial together. And um, I'll just have to show you him again. And <laughs> so we did races together. And he would say, wiggle your toes. And then he goes, when you get tired, just say the word more. And <laughs> that sounds silly, but he was just like, more, breathe, more. And I could find this space in me that I didn't know I had. So that's my grandfather. So I'm happy you guys love him as much as I do, I can tell. <laughs> so I started racing because of him. And I uh, got my first pro contract within three months of um, riding a bike. And I raced around the world for Team USA and all, all of this. Um, I currently serve on the board of USA Cycling as well as USOPC, so the Team USA. Um, I'm an athlete advocate. I do a lot of work as well as ride my bike for Specialized. Um, but a little bit about going into my career there is I raced a lot and it happened fast and a lot of things happened. But really early in my career, I had a very traumatic crash where I was racing at a professional race. We had just won the Giro d'Italia. First Americans to ever win the Giro, first American and then also a national team to win. And it was big and I was confident. And I came back to the US, did a race, ended up crashing, going, um, I don't want to count cracks in helmets for the record because that'll traumatize me. Because I didn't have any. <laughs> but 45 miles an hour to zero, life flighted out, uh, traumatic brain injury, broken pelvis, broken everything. I've actually broken most bones in my body by now. but. Um, that was really tough to come back. And I actually came back to the sport really quick. Um, and I came back probably too fast because I was so fixated on this goal, Olympics and all this qualifying and my whole identity was wrapped up in my recovery. And you can look at broken bones because you can see the fuzzy bone, you can see it healing, but the brain, you can't see. You can go to a neuropsychologist, a therapist, neuroscience, but like, you can't see what actually is happening in your mental health. So I came back way too fast. I was actually very successful and extremely unhealthy. Um, and then I crashed again at the Pan American Games. Uh, this was my Olympic spot. This was a big deal. And I crashed, just silly, uh, warming up in Guadalajara, Mexico. And then it was just lights out. Um, I. I took wrong turns in a time trial that was, there was like five turns in them, you know, like things like that. It was bad. And then I went home and that's where depression comes in, anxiety and all these things. And I had to relearn how to read <laughs> and a lot of that. And so I was very mad at the bike and this is where <laughs> my show and tell, um, 
this happened, but I was really mad at the bike, and this made bicycling, which is just, the bike owes me, and I, it has a swear word on there that my mom was really upset about. But um, when the doctor asked her why she needed to make a comeback, she said, because the effing bike owes me something. At least they said effing, because that's not what I said. But I came back to the sport, but I had to regain my identity and what my relationship with the sport wanted to be. And it had to be that I was so much more than a cyclist. Now I'm a wife, I'm a friend, I'm a daughter, I am a granddaughter still. <laughs> Um, I am so much more, I'm a biochemist, I'm a cowgirl, I'm a storyteller, like all those things we say, but at the time I was so fixated on the bike and it was everything. And uh, a lot of therapy and all of that later, I worked through that to come back to the sport and then I was pissed. Was still pretty good. Uh, I went to grad school, studied uh, neuropsychology because a neuropsychologist really helped me. Um, that's a very expensive way to prove that uh, you can read again, for the record. Going to get your, yeah, don't do that maybe. So. The cycling definitely just has changed my life in so much. So I went from World Tour and to Gravel, and you guys might know me more from Gravel or from World Tour. So I've raced for teams like Astana, stand on the World Tour stage for multiple races. But then at one point in my career, I was tired, and that's back to finding goals that inspire you. I was just like, I can race Flanders, I can race the Tour, the Giro, I can do all these things, but I want to do something that makes me happy right now. And that was, uh, at the time, Dirty Kanza, but Unbound. And I told my team director I wanted to race 206 miles. I thought it was 200. It's 206 miles um, of gravel there in Emporia, Kansas. He said, that's crazy, but we can do it. So um, I did. I won. Uh, I had the course record for several years, but that changed my life. There was something about just connecting with the people that ride gravel. Here in Sonoma County, I'll be honest, I ride all road on my Roubaix because <laughs> our pavement's amazing. Um, <laughs> I know. I live. Yeah, I know. That I, I ride a Roubaix, has the future shock, right? And I just bulldoze all that. <laughs> Kathy's off a of Walker Road, and I just can hit all those potholes. I call it Sonoma Tapestry. I love it. And people were like, do you train on gravel? I'm like, no, I ride in Sonoma County. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> but <laughs> from my first UCI wins to um, just really funny stories about meeting people from all over the world that I was fortunate to call my teammates and friends that are still racing. Um, like I said, a lot of losses, a lot of pain, but ultimately it has just been an incredible ride that's continuing. And that's because of people like you and clubs like you that are getting people and girls and women and more people on bikes. And that's really important to me. So my few things, you learned what Grampy said, and I'm not as smart as Grampy, but uh, my things I've learned throughout my career, and I'm not done yet racing or riding, and I won't be, because we just learned from Grampy that cycling is timeless and sports know no age. And that's why we're all here, because there's always something you can be better at and challenge yourself for. But uh, something I've used in my life was just be bold. Fortune favors the bold or the brave, depending on how you want to do it, but I'm gonna say bold. Because sometimes, like, just, you know, do it and apologize later. Like, you have to try. Because so many of these things in life that we're scared, and whether that's on your bike, doing your century, or do you want to do the B group or the C group? Are you, like, worried you're gonna get dropped? Like, things like that, like, you just have to try. And there's so many, so many of us just sit there, like, afraid, and that's me too. But I just learned I had to go for it and try. So if you, I ever sign a card for you, I'll probably write Be Bold because that's the only way I can get out of bed in the morning because it's hard. Um, and the, the other thing when I was racing was uh, the race is always in front of you. Um, when you guys watch a tour, hopefully also the Women's Tour de France Femme of Egg Zwift, um, when you're watching that too and somebody attacks and they look back like immediately, I'm like, he's not. No commit, no send, <laughs> like that's not gonna happen. So, so many people like you go hard and then you look back. So remembering that the, everything's in front of you and then uh, my friend was, that I rode with today, he said everything, be everything behind you is their problem. <laughs> that's how he phrased it. <laughs> so just thinking about looking forward, doing that forward progress, take care of yourself. And for me, if I just keep pedaling my bike forward and take care of myself and others, hopefully if I can, um, I'll, that'll keep me going. Um, Another thing is just mainly I have a pet peeve on the word suffering because so many cyclists, and I do the Move podcast with Lance. We have a very good podcast if you guys want to listen about women's cycling, also men's. And but he has this like suffer, <laughs> you know, it's like we suffer. I'm like, God, I hate that word. Like I'm like suffering on my bike, but look at what's going around in the world. Like so many things are going on. Like I'm not suffering. 
it's a privilege. And Billie Jean Queen, King has a quote that says pressure is a privilege. And, and, uh, and um, I, I had a team that gave me socks that had like suffer on the bed of the foot or whatever. And I, we, my whole team was so mad about that because we're like, we're not sacrificing, we're not suffering, this is our choice. So we turned the socks inside out and I think we got fined. But, <laughs> um, but anyway, just remember, like when you're hurting on a bike, it's it's your choice, and that's so fun, right? Like you're deciding to get better, to challenge yourself. Um, so also, like, don't afraid to say, be afraid to say yes. I've done a lot. Um, I got a call that said, "Do you want to go on a trip on a Lifetime?" And I was in Kyrgyzstan bike packing the Silk Road, or I am doing a podcast with Lance Armstrong. You know, like I just not afraid to say yes, and that, I think that's just something I've learned. And the last one that's most important to me that I've also learned when we're talking about the identity is that um, start lines are more important than finish lines, in my opinion. And so many people celebrate those finish lines. You got the champagne, you got the winner, you got your time, your PR, blah, blah, blah. But you know the courage it takes, especially through all the depression, everything I went through in this traumatic brain injury, which I still deal with every single day, just to show up to the line. So like when I want us to just celebrate start lines because it takes courage to show up. And that to me is the most beautiful part about the sport and why everyone is in this room. You guys showed up. And then what can you do from there? Anything. Um, and that's, I guess as I'm closing here, it's just cycling is all to me about this community and connection and the opportunities that can come from that. I've made a career out of riding my bike. Um, I'm very fortunate for that. I've worked really hard. But um, it just opens a door for advocacy, product development, um, equality, diversity, inclusion, like things that I can do in my space now. Um, which brings me <laughs> to another Bicycling Magazine, if you guys want to know about saddles, anyone wants a question, that's also another <laughs> cover of Bicycling here. But we are able to launch a saddle specific for women's issues on comfort. And I work with Specialized on that, and we have launched several mm -hmm. lines of saddles. But that was really scary to talk about, to launch a, a saddle about women's issues um, with millions of views on YouTube, where I say words that I was very uncomfortable that my mother heard. but. <laughs> <laughs> we sold saddles and we are also addressed a problem. And, and for me, I asked Blaze about this article before it came out because we put a lot of work into that. And I said, I'm, this is very embarrassing. I'm not sure I want to do this. And he said, if not you, who? And that goes back to what we've talked about. So um, there's a lot of work there. I've uh, presented at Congress uh, addressing the gender gaps in uh, health and studies. As a biochemist, I have done a lot of research but there's a lot of concussions. And women are up to two to three million. That's a big gap of things. But there's different symptoms. So I mean, just gender gaps in research and science on what that looks like. And so um, it was great. We have a health initiative there at, uh, in Capitol Hill now that uh, Dr. Jill Biden signed. But I got to talk to also the Department of Defense just on how to help women be able to have accommodations that you need for your specific gender. So working with Camelback on different sizing, specialize the saddle. Um, it's just, it's really fun for me to be able to do that. Um, and to also use my experience that when I was dealing with my traumatic brain injury, um, people were telling me I was different and everything was wrong, but I felt so alone because no one had researched my issue yet. And still to this day, we haven't. So. Also, just be very careful of your heads, guys. <laughs> Sorry. So anyway, I, it's, it's been, it just opened up a lot for me. Um, and all the winning or losing, a lot of losing. And the people I get to meet, though, ultimately is the most important part. So um, yeah, so you can ask any questions on that. And basically, where to find me. <laughs> Is, um, I live in Petaluma, and uh, I do sell bandanas. Um, I know it's a thing, but cowgirl. I have bandanas here that I sell, and those uh, money goes to NorCal High School Cycling Mountain Bike League, and um, I'll specifically to the GRIT program, which is called Girls Riding Together. They actually do a big camp out, out in Petaluma, so I get to go and camp with these young student athletes and um, just getting more 
kids on bikes, but especially more girls on bikes. Uh, so that's something I do. I did talk about the podcast. Um, I host a podcast called The Move with Lance Armstrong. Um, and we cover on the women's cycling side of things, uh, mainly Tour de France and all the big stuff. Um, so that's really fun. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Yeah, what one more plug for uh, Ali? Make sure you follow her on Facebook or Instagram or whatever your your, your social media. And we brought choices. some bandanas if some anyone wants to partake in and some hats. Uh, well, folks, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, quite a presentation, um, engaging uh, conversations uh, with our club members from the Santa Rosa Cycling Club, and I uh, hope you enjoyed that. So, if you did, make sure you do all that standard YouTube stuff like like, subscribe, and notify, and um, make sure you go out and ride. Have fun, and of course, keep the rubber side down. Bye, y'all.